Welcome back to this week's paper review and today we are analyzing two of the most clickbaity terms you could possibly imagine for a paper title. Today's title is post activation potentiation in blood flow restricted complex training. So if you want to know what this is all about and what the results of this were, stay tuned. Yeah, so what blood flow restriction training and PAP are at the moment, this kind of two great clickbaity terms for ways of getting more effectiveness from training or more performance outcomes uh, with less input or with less fatigue variables afterwards. So PAP, the first thing is post-activation potentiation, where we'd mostly see this is in uh, high force output, so in sprinting and jumping uh, testing, where we have really high loading uh, directly beforehand. So it might be something like doing a five rep max back squat or five reps at relatively heavy weights in a back squat, and then going into something like a 50 meter sprint or a max vertical jump and seeing an increased performance outcome having done your five reps in a squat directly beforehand. What we'll see for blood flow restriction training is in kind of hypertrophy outcomes is that you have to use much lower loads when you restrict blood flow to a muscle. Uh, you get increased uh, muscular damage and increased damage to the capillaries. So you get better hypertrophy outcomes when you restrict blood flow to a muscle and then do your exercises with a much lower weight. So it might be 30 reps with 30% of one rep max on a bicep curl. Um, so in... In populations that are coming back from injuries or in populations that can't apply large amounts of force, uh, you can get quite good hypertrophy outcomes. So today's paper is coming from the UK. It is titled Post-Activation Potentiation in Blood Flow Restricted Complex Training. We had a group of 15 males with some resistance training. They had familiarization with the back squat and vertical jumps. These were split into two groups. They had three sessions. The first session was a familiarization session. And then the following two sessions were in randomized order with two different squat protocols. So what were measured was vertical height before one of the squat protocols and then vertical height or vertical jump height after the squat protocol. So the squat protocols were was just one session where they found in the familiarization session, they found their one RM back squat. Then they move to what's termed as a heavy load session or HL is in the notes here. So they went to approximately 85% of their one rep max, which they found they used IPF standard um, kind of protocols or rules for the depth of the squat. And then they completed approximately five reps at their uh, 85%. So they had their vertical jump height measured pre-squat and then measured again post-squat. Okay, then. Using this one RM, they had another session approximately three to four days later. They applied their blood flow restriction cuffs. So these are measured prior with their um, what's known as um, arterial occlusion pressure. So how tight the cuff needs to be. This was applied for them and calculated. Then they completed 30 reps um, at 30% of their one RM. Then they measured their vertical jump. And obviously they measured the vertical jump pre blood flow restriction training. And then they, for both of these, for the heavy loads and the B, uh, BFR, they measured, they had two sets. So they got a kind of an average of two sets, two sets across both sessions. Um, also in conjunction with what was measured was an EMG of their um, vas lateralis and their hamstring. So this was just a measure in the activation. Uh, this kind of ties in with what Fitz mentioned about what PAP was and potentially any kind of additional uh, neural activation in these muscles okay so in terms of results what we're really looking for here is what was the outcome on vertical jump um afterwards so after they did their kind of high low training or after they did their blood flow restriction training what was the change in their vertical jump obviously as we've kind of alluded to a post activation potentiation if it occurred we'd expect this number to go up we see that in both cases uh both high low training and blood flow restrictive training that post-activation potentiation did not occur. So we get uh, our pre-test uh, measure, so our pre-jump is higher in both cases than it will be post. Um, and then in terms of the difference, we saw the largest difference in the blood flow restrictive training after two sets, um, that that's when we got the biggest decrease in vertical jump. So in both of these cases, post-activation potentiation did not occur. They still did the 
the calculation to see what per percentage. It was obviously a negative percentage. So we can just simply say neither of these brought about any post-activation potentiation. I'll flash the table up on the screen now just so you can see. Okay, then the next thing we're looking at is those EMG output values. Um, so the EMG is measuring the electrical activity that's happening in the muscle tissue. There was no set by condition interaction uh, for EMG. So basically what we're seeing is there's no kind of post-activation post -activation potentiation being shown through EMG. As Gurf spoke about earlier, we're not seeing this uh, kind of prolonged spike in EMG activity following either the high-low condition or the blood flow restrictive condition. What we do see is during both of the training sets, the high load has greater EMG activity happening in the muscle than the blood flow restrictive. So that's obviously to do with the intensity, the relative intensity of the exercise. So we need stronger contractions to move higher loads um, because you need the muscle to recruit or you need the body to recruit more muscle tissue. So it's obviously firing more electrical signals into the muscle. Uh, there's nothing really revolutionary here coming out of either of these like it, we would have expected to see higher loads producing higher emg values um and we would therefore have expected the blood flow restrictive training to give us lower uh emg values okay so to start the discussion we immediately have to point the elephant to the room right pap didn't occur we didn't get this increased output following a high load or a blood flow restrictive load we didn't even get a difference between the two mainly. Uh, so this is obviously the first thing we need to discuss. Why did it not occur here when it has occurred in previous studies? And the general kind of rule of thumb is that we would have expected maybe a 2 or a 3% increase in vertical jump height following some sort of uh, contraction immediately beforehand. So the rest periods they're taking aren't incredibly different from the rest periods we're taking in other studies. In other studies, we see rest periods from two, three, four, and five minutes following exercise into their test condition. So there's nothing different there. But what we're probably seeing here is the population group it's tested on being very different. So other studies referenced in this are track and field athletes. We have rugby players. We have semi-pro athletes who are doing high volume training, high load training, and then some sort of plyometric training in their kind of everyday or every year training cycle. What we have in this group of people is we have a group of people whose average squat is somewhere around 150 kilos. Uh, their average body weight is somewhere in the 70 kilos. They're said to be uh, relatively experienced in resistance training. As we kind of all know with scientific studies like this, they're done in college kids um resistance training or experienced in resistance training probably means they've gone to the gym a few times in the last year or year and a half um and that therefore qualifies them in previous studies and in the, the kind of studies that are referenced in the discussion of this paper they haven't seen good post activation post activation potentiation outcomes in non-experienced uh cohorts so that's more than likely what we're seeing here you're not as skilled in the movements, you're not as skilled in high force output, and therefore PAP doesn't occur for you as easily. So a couple of things about this study are worth mentioning. First of all, the type of squat they did was an interesting choice compared to what they measured in on the EMG. So they, in the EMG, they measured basically their, essentially their quad involvement and their hamstring involvement. However, it was kind of specified, uh, which is unusual, but they did low bar back squats to IPF rules. So assuming the people involved in this were some form of powerlifters, um, you know, so they obviously had some experience probably themselves with powerlifting. So it's interesting that they chose to do low bar back squats, which would primarily be lower back and glutes, which are not typically the muscles you would evolve in a vertical jump. So it may have been the fact that when they went to do these vertical jumps, basically the muscles that are involved in their squat were not then correlated to the muscles they were using as much in the vertical jump. So that's why we might not have seen any PAP involved, you know. So like, for example, the studies that would be done on athletes, track and field athletes who do these PAP studies and who've gone, like, gotten maybe 2-3% increase in their vertical jump height, very likely either doing some kind of high bar half squat and 
intentionally done a half squat which would perfectly make sense for a vertical jump or they did reasonable full depth squats with a high bar position again which would primarily involve their quads which very very likely is the case because we very rarely ever see athletes do low bar back squats so i think that's possibly one of the reasons now another reason they were giving in their discussion was that they think it may have been that these people were essentially just not that familiar or adapted to explosive movements like the vertical jump which is why when they went to do them after it's likely that they were just shit of vertical jumps anyway and then when they went to do them after squats it's very unlikely that they're going to get better especially after squats so for whatever it might be for after five reps at 85 percent which is probably which is a reasonable struggle for them for anyone realistically to go from a set of 10 with blood flow restriction a new stimulus it's almost certainly they've never done bf4 kind of training and then to go do a vertical jump is um it's not surprising however in the defense of the study i think it is useful that someone did this it answers a question that is does this work because in retrospect when you look at these results you're like well obviously that's not going to work if you do a set of 10 with bf4 you're obviously going to be fatigued you're not going to get a higher vertical jump but it does answer the question that if an untrained athlete does this is there any use and from their kind of from their results it looks like it does absolutely nothing uh they got negative in both the high load and the bf4 the only kind of um kind of counter argument to that is that the high load realistically should have increased their v uh, vertical jump height by a little bit which it has done in other athletes but again i think that's probably from the use of the low bar back squat as opposed to the uh high bar squat back squat kind of a traditional weightlifting squat ultimately i think it's useful to have this answer it's useful to have a, an answer for this like is this useful for athletics and for the general population most athletes will have a coach telling them what to do so realistically they're not going to involve themselves in their training process and they're not going to look at something and decide if they're going to do it they're realistically going to be told if they're um professional athletes or semi-pro athletes someone's going to tell them what they're going to do and they don't need to um really think about their own training what's useful about this is the fact that these were just recreational strength training athletes which very likely a lot of you watching are and you pap is kind of a buzzword and we do get questions about the odd time is it, is it useful and realistically if you're trying to increase your vertical jump as an amateur recreational gym goer this is not the way to go for you by the looks of things yeah so there are like there are definitely some interesting points there right i think the low bar um, versus what we usually see when people are back squatting in a, a test environment like this probably did have some sort of an impact. Uh, I agree that the these studies are, are interesting. I agree that these studies are important. And definitely, right, studies like this where you're testing one or two novel things and seeing if they can collaborate or if they can kind of add on to each other so you get increased efficacy these studies are what like people get into sports science to really look into um but we have to look at like look a small bit deeper into the pathways surrounding things like pap or look a bit deeper into the the mechanical things that are happening when we have blood flow restriction happening like when you've blood flow restriction uh happening in a muscle you're basically inducing more capillary damage uh, and because of that capillary damage, you have better outcomes for hypertrophy or there are, there appear to be better outcomes for hypertrophy. The kind of applications that blood flow restriction trainings are useful in will be like returning from injury or you have an injury somewhere else that, can, that doesn't allow you to support load in your own structure. So take, for example, I have somebody who has broken their wrist and we're looking to do like some sort of hypertrophy work in the upper arm or the shoulder, right? What it allows you to do is you could use some sort of like apparatus to strap weight on above the wrist, so away from an injured area. They can then apply some sort of blood flow restriction, do their training with much, much lower loads than they usually would. So might be with a band or a cable instead of with an actual free weight. And you can still get relatively good hypertrophy outcomes. So Blood flow restrictive training in that case can be very effective, right? Or if you have an athlete who needs some sort of hypertrophy work, but the load for standard hypertrophy work would in, kind of encroach too much on their normal training, then you have the lower loads and uh, associated blood flow restrictive training can be very useful. Realistically, bringing PAP 
into a situation like that, it doesn't really tally up right. So PAP is getting maximal outcomes in terms of maximal contraction, uh, really, really high force output, incredibly short uh, action terms. There are things we don't see in hypertrophy training, but there are things we see exclusively in high force output training. So the blending of these two constructs is is quite novel, but it, uh, the negative kind of, or the net, the net zero we see here of it not really having any effect is more than likely what you'd see when you join two constructs like this that don't really mesh in together at all. Obviously, it would be incredibly useful if you could strap a blood flow cuff or like a blood pressure cuff onto somebody's arm, get them to do loads of like 30 reps with very, very light weight and then suddenly they can smash a golf ball further than ever before or hit a baseball further than ever before because it won't fatigue them too much. You won't get the the negatives that are associated with like the high force outputs that PAP usually needs. Um, so I think it is quite interesting. It's just disappointing it didn't work and I don't think it's really surprising it didn't work either. So thanks again for watching the paper review. As always, put your thoughts and your uh, your comments below. If you have papers that you'd like us to look into, or if there's kind of general ideas you want to look into, like I know PAP was brought up a few times in the last week, so that's why we were eager enough to do this paper when we saw it. Um, but if there are con constructs you're thinking about, if there's ideas you have with your own training that you want us to look into the literature for, pop them into the comments. As always, if you want training programs, go to seekastrength.com. You can do the Seek a Strength Road to Anywhere squat program. You can do the X-Press program for your bench press or your strict press. And you can do the Seek a Pull, so it's the 10-week deadlift program. For all other one-to-one -one coaching and consultancy inquiries, just go to our, uh, you can send us an email, seekastrength.gmail.com, or you can go to the website and just pop us a message there. Thanks for watching.